Hi, Nick Beach here. Um, I was watching this debate between Steven Crowder and this uh, fat lesbian, and uh, it came, you know, gave me a few uh, some inspiration and so I got a few comments about it. Um, one of the things I like about uh, Crowder's approach to this basically is he personalizes the debate as much as he can. So rather than kind of go at the woman with like talking points and uh, theory and uh, you know conceptual in concept, this is, you know will work in a certain way, and you know such and such professor uh, has demonstrated that X, Y, and Z is the case. Rather than doing this kind of a thing, he personalizes the uh, debate by talking about, for example, a friend of his who was fined uh, something like fifty grand or one hundred fifty grand for uh, using for I don't know dropping some word, sort of the C word, the N word, the something or other word, and. Um, you know, just talking about how this erosion of free speech protections is just uh, it's, it's, it's killing conversation, it's killing comedy, it's killing debate, and all the rest of it. And this is just much better, you know, because people people can always doubt your, your statistics that you bring to bear, that you, your sources, you know, the authority which they have or, or lack thereof. But if you're talking about somebody who's actually been been harmed by this in your, in your you know in your own life, in your own or in your orbit, then this is going to have a much better effect on on much it's going to be much more persuasive anyway. Um, the other thing which which um, I would I would add to this and it's something which you did not do, but this is a kind of a, a uh, kind of a game I used to play, which is actually quite effective in in, in debating, is to uh, embrace the loss. Don't suck it up. Actually embrace it. And by that I mean, if you're debating somebody and they they, they make a point which uh, you you realize you know oh they really got you. The thing to do is not to try to not try to divert their arguments elsewhere or say or get engaged in what about ism or, or or any kind of nonsense like that. The thing to do is to totally acknowledge what they say and then up them up the ante. Um, and the way in which you do that is you 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 first of all you say yeah you know you're absolutely right. And usually that will kind of produce a kind of a silence because people are really shocked when somebody actually admits they're wrong in a heated debate. <laughs> they don't anticipate that at all. The like room kind of goes silent. And that, that, that helps give you, you know, the time that you need to figure out the next step. And the next step is when, once you've embraced the fact that the person is, is wrong, you're going to have to deal with your own feelings of kind of shame, embarrassment, because you were hard, you know, you were, you were, you were soldiering off for this point and you figured you, were, you had it, you know, down solid, but all of a sudden it's, it turns out, you know, you, you were just being an idiot. You were being an idiot. Now, what you need to do to to restore your self confidence and your 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 your, your dignity <laughs> is you, you, you what you do is you, you show the person that the argument is even more right. It's even it's even more powerful and more forceful than, than they even conceived of in the first place. Let's say you're libertarian like me. You're you're debating some some um, you know some non libertarian moron. I feel pardon my French. And um, you're talking about, about the value of money, and you're talking about how it, money's, you know, it works better than barter, and the efficiencies therein, and all the rest of it. And the other person's carrying on about how money is the root of all evil for reasons X, Y, and Z. Let's say for the sake of argument that you actually, you, you, you realize, hey, wait a minute, this guy's actually right. Now, you, you were throwing all these arguments based on, you know, on logic and on, on theory and all the rest of it, and you had this, this emotional investment in these arguments, and all of a sudden you, you realize that you have to admit that you're, you, you need, you should anyway, Admit that you're wrong, because otherwise you're going to make things even worse. So you try to come up with these idiotic counterarguments when you know you're wrong, because you're going to give the game away through your facial expressions and all the rest of it. The thing to do then is to say, well, you know, money is the root of all evil, but it's even worse than you think. You know, because you're really honest with it. It's even worse. It really is more, more monstrous than you than you imagine, because money not only uh, perverts people's people's morals and leads them down this, this down a dark path of uh, use and abuse and um, you know and thievery and, and scamming and all the rest of it. Um, but it's even worse because it can actually destroy an entire society. Because when, you, when when money collapses, for example, like it did, for example, in Germany, let's say 1921, 1922. Uh, people, everybody is just, just kind of driven to extremes and having to engage in, in thuggery, you know, robbing, beating, to get, to get stuff from people, murdering people for their possession, for whatever the, they have, that, that kind of a thing. And that in turn then led to this moral collapse, which then ushered in the, the Nazi movement, right? It, made, it gave it legitimacy because democracy wasn't working, which then, of course, and once the Nazis were in, then, of course, that led to Hitler, which then led to the Holocaust and all the rest of that. So you know, dude, you're right. Money really is the root of all evil. It's, it's the root of, of, of not just individual evil, but a social evil, of, of, of global evil. Now, I don't buy this malarkey argument at all. But you can see what I'm talking about. The way to win the argument is not to try, is not to, try to come up with some kind of hocus-pocus uh, malarkey whereby you can sort of, you can, you can, you can kind of hopefully get an edge over somebody by, by you know, impressing them with, with, your, with your knowledge of something or with, with your vocabulary or... 
if you try to mock them, you just kind of attitudinize them or if you accuse them of being stupid or something like that, because none of that shit's going to work. The thing to do to, to, to retain your dignity is as soon as you realize you're wrong, stop on a dime, turn on a dime, and take the argument back to the person and show them that they missed something. They missed, they missed, they missed some, some extrapolative uh, significance of their own argument. And when you do that, you'll really impress them. You'll impress yourself. You'll impress the audience. Okay, and you'll emerge with your with your uh, dignity intact. Here, I think Stephen Crowder does a good job of personalizing the argument, and uh, pretty much does the same kind of thing I would do. You'll see here. So these are people in government, people in positions of authority who use this term. Um, why would you want to grant the right to legislate language to people in positions of power or authority? I just feel like you're given you that should... power. Yeah, giving, you know, turning over this authority to bureaucrats, <laughs> you know, people who are susceptible to whatever political pressures or whatever, whatever pressures exerted upon them by the editorial page of any for the New York Times, Washington Post, etc. There just be such people are just going to cave. I mean, you really want to entrust your rights to people like that? That's just insane. Power away to the right. patriarchy. Those words specifically. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's the patriarchy. That's exactly how you do it. Yeah, very good dehumanize people. Sure, but is the point the is, someone is going to be determining what language is a Yeah, dehumanize people. Again, she's just talking in these kind of cliches. I don't blame her for it, it's just she's not used to debating. And we all kind of start out talking, you know, about things in a sort of conceptual way. But speaking in a conceptual fashion really doesn't personalize a, an issue sufficiently such that you can really take it to heart. It's kind of like why storytelling is so useful. When you when you wrap an idea around a human being, people can get it. They can they can relate to what's happening. They can say, well, if that person reacted this way to that in that situation to that particular concept or phenomenon or whatever, then I can imagine what I would do similarly in that situation too. Allowed or not, right? You want to give that right over to the government? Maybe not. You want Donald government. Trump to determine? No. What yeah, maybe not. She's not even thinking. She doesn't even know what to say other than to say no to whatever he says. <laughs> That's the worst way to fight to discuss things. You cannot get in this get in this situation whereby you just think you have to dig your heels in. Like whatever the other person says, you must disagree with, which is what she just did. And then he says, so you want Donald Trump? And then she immediately, again, she responds like, like a robot to that uh, provocation. Oh, I don't gonna... want Donald Trump. Okay, I don't so the next guy. Donald Trump should be the president. Well, but... who cares? So the point I... is... Exactly, personalize it. Yeah, who cares? Exactly the right thing to do. Don't get into some, some crazy argument about, okay, well, yeah, but Trump's done this and Trump's done that. He's really, he's, he's a great guy. I mean, I love Trump myself, but that's not the thing to do. Just say who cares. Exactly. You know, confront the person. That's what you should be doing here, not just, you know, pitching arguments, cliches at each other. You want him in, in charge of language? No, I feel like it should be like a national vote. Like, that's what I think. So do you believe that all rights come from a national vote? <laughs> Well, no, but okay. I think she's lying. She has no idea what he's talking about. I feel like certain things should. Well, okay, let me give, give you this as an example. Um, in these other countries like Canada, where I come from, you have comedians who've been jailed for offensive jokes. Uh, there's actually a friend of mine named Mike Ward uh, who was put before he... Yeah, that's exactly how to do it. Talk about people you know, your friends. Don't talk about some case, some, some time happened somewhere, you know, when you get like a he, he said versus she said situation. Make it personal. Human Rights Tribunal, and I believe fined $150,000 or $50,000 for a joke that offended a kid from a Make-A-Wish Foundation. You have people who are arrested left and right in Europe. Um, in the UK, there was a man who was actually, I believe, fined because he was doing a cover of Kung Fu Fighting at a karaoke bar, and an Asian person said that that was offensive to him. Yeah, this is just really hilarious. Okay, check this out. This is too crazy to... <laughs> A musician from the Isle of Wight has been arrested on suspicion of racially aggravated harassment. This was back in uh, 2011. After playing the song Kung Fu Fighting, Simon Ledger says a Chinese man took offence when he performed the disco classic at a gig on Sunday. Charlotte McCarthy reports. Yeah, he was arrested for playing a song, Kung Fu Fighting, which was a big hit when I was a kid. <laughs> I used to listen to it all the time. It's now a crime. <laughs> It was a 70s hit at the you devil. center of the disco scene. And of course it's a black guy. The, 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 the singer is uh, Carl Lewis, I think was his name. Yeah, he's, he's, he's black. So it's a black guy singing a song and the white guy gets arrested for it. <laughs> what the bloody hell.
But Kung Fu fighting is now at the centre of a race row. Simon Ledger was performing at this bar in Sandown when trouble flared. Ooh, that looks pretty, pretty, pretty dark and kind of. Ooh, I don't know. That, that bar looks like trouble to me. Playing the song, and uh, uh, the gentleman and his mother walked past as we were playing the start of the song, and uh, I think he thought it was aimed at him, and he took it the wrong way. It wasn't aimed at him. It's a song we play all the time. I think he just took it personally, and it's it's ridiculous. We would never have played it intentionally uh, from a racist point of view. It's a great song. Officers arrested the singer later that evening at this Chinese restaurant. Yeah, he's later arrested at a Chinese restaurant, presumably for the crime of eating Chinese food. When I spoke to the police, I thought, first off, they were joking. Obviously, they said they weren't. It was more <laughs> yeah. serious. Um, I understand they've got a job to do. You know, an allegation's been made. It's very, very serious. They yeah, very, very serious. <laughs> I mean, it makes you wonder if he's if he's taking this, if he's trying to put a straight face on this uh, imbecility, what's going on, what kind of cops they have running the Newport Police Station. It must be a real bunch of fucking bozos. I mean, a real bunch of hardliners is what I'm getting at. They have to follow it through. Hampshire Police said in a statement... If a victim believes an alleged crime is racially aggravated, the police will treat... Yeah, check that out. An alleged crime is racially aggravated. Okay, so what was the crime? The crime was playing the song... And it was racially aggravated by the fact that he had he was uh, Anglo-Saxon. So if you think about it, it just makes no sense whatsoever. An alleged crime is racially aggravated. What what was the crime? There was no crime, right? What what playing a song is not a crime. <laughs> These fucking police are illiterate, and that's one of the problems with putting stuff like this in the hands of the so-called government. You, you know. Sooner or later, you're going to have some like, a bunch of total zeros in charge of enforcing these laws and interpreting these laws, and then and this is exactly what you have here. Any anybody with an IQ above 85 would have known, would have read this as being alleged crime. What was the crime? We played the song. It's not a it's not a crime to play a song, but it was racially motiv motivated. Well, even if it was racially aggravated, there was no crime. There was no crime. Hello, but these idiots. But oh, well, yeah, as long as as long as race is involved, it's necessarily a crime. Which of course it's not. Just can these people read English? Apparently not. Read it seriously in accordance with a high set of standards. Investigations. Yeah, and a low set of uh, literacy. This allegation is continuing to establish the full circumstances surrounding what happened. Mr. We're going to get to the bottom of this. I bet there was a conspiracy. <laughs> the Russians were involved, probably interviewed by police here at Newport Station later this evening when he'll find out if he faces any charges. Charlotte McCarthy, BBC South Today on the Isle of Wight. Uh, they actually didn't charge him in the end. It was too ridiculous. And that, of course, that's 2011. These days he would be charged, I'm sure, absolutely. Uh, because the, the, the police in Scotland, for example, they routinely go beyond the law. You can be charged with crimes which are not uh, illegal in Scotland. So this is the real thing on the Twitter particularly. Anyway, um, I'll try to keep this short, so I'll just leave it at that. Basically what I'm getting at anyway is the, the virtues of taking your argument to you, the person that you're, that you're dealing with. Uh, per, always personalize your argument whenever you can. And again, um, Stephen Crowder doesn't do this. He doesn't, he doesn't go, you're right, and here's why you're even more right than you realize and than you appreciate. He doesn't have that kind of opportunity because he doesn't really have a good debater. And he says she's not going to be able to change his mind because she's kind of robotic in her uh, responses. But again, when you have the chance, if you do lose an argument, by all means, turn, boom, like that. You know, get, you know, get, the, get the jump on it. You know, don't wait for people to kind of hammer it home and make you, make you look even dumber than, than you perhaps you were in the first place, or me, or whoever it is, right? Uh, don't let yourself look, look stupid. Just get right on it and, and change your mind immediately, and then get to work. Because people give you, people are kind of like shocked. The kind of conversation often will just kind of stop, because people are like, they're so surprised that you admit you're right, because you're in the middle of some kind of fierce, you know, discussion. And use that moment, you know, keep your presence in mind, be, you know, use that moment to figure out why they're even more right than they thought they were. And they probably were. It's, it's, it's an honest thing to do anyway. And uh, you have a win-win situation in your hands. People think, wow, this guy's pretty fucking clever and interesting. So that's what I would do if I was you. Anyway, I guess that's it for now. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.